It's dark and raining outside, and a man stands there holding another man, saying he's already dead. He turns to a lady, asking what she wants him to do if she wants him to live or die. She looks at him and says he should kill him, and he agrees to do what she wishes without question. Nearby, one of the doctors is exhausted. He complains about how sore he feels and how long the shift has been dragging on, wondering when it'll end. All he can think about is going home. He notices the cleaner busy with her work, cleaning every corner with so much energy, like she isn't even tired. She gives them a friendly greeting, and they both reply. One of the doctors comments on how full of life she is, working hard and not slowing down. The other doctor chimes in, saying she's been so focused on cleaning the fourth floor, almost like it's her favorite thing to do. She keeps at it, not letting up, even as they talk. In another part of the building, the kids are standing near the flower beds. One of them points out how the flowers were looking weak and nearly dead not long ago. They thank the cleaner, saying she has done wonders with her care. She smiles and tells them to call her by a more familiar name instead of something formal. They happily thank her again, showing how much they appreciate what she's done. She tells them they need to be careful when they play near the flowers because, just like them, the plants don't like to be unwell or mistreated. They nod in understanding, and the boy mentions how much he dislikes getting shots and taking medicine because of how bitter it is. They begin to chant her name as if she's some kind of hero, and she laughs, telling them she knows it's not easy. But if they can be brave and get through it, just like the flowers, they'll come out stronger. She's about to say more, but before she can finish, one of the doctors steps in, complimenting her on how skilled she is, and the kids rush over to greet him. The doctor comes over, saying he heard the kids were fooling around and ended up damaging some of the flowers, but it looks like she managed to bring them back to life. He introduces himself as Dayang Oh, an associate professor of pediatrics. She brushes it off, saying it's no big deal and she should probably get back to work, ready to head inside right away. But he stops her, telling her to wait because he didn't come to give her another task. Instead, he just has a message to pass on. She's curious and asks what it is. With a smile, he congratulates her, saying she'll be in charge of the fourth floor's surgery center starting this afternoon. Her face lights up with excitement. He's been wondering for a while why she's been so eager to go to the fourth floor. He heard she used to work somewhere else before this job, and he's curious about what made her so interested in the new assignment. She hesitates for a moment before admitting that there's someone she absolutely has to meet, someone important to her, and that's the real reason she wanted to be on the fourth floor. Later, she's told she'll be working in the HPB surgery department, but she wonders if she assumed too much about her role. As she's thinking, Juim O, oh, her supervisor, walks up to her and asks what she's doing just standing there. She's supposed to report directly to the cleaning department when she arrives, not wander around the hospital. Embarrassed, she quickly apologizes, explaining that she just wanted to take a quick look at the new place she's been assigned to. Jim replies that they've just finished a surgery, and the operating room is likely a mess, so she needs to go clean it thoroughly. She agrees and heads off to work, thinking to herself that Yui must really be strict if she's cutting her own lunch short just to check on everything. She finally finishes cleaning up, and just needs to take the last bit of waste from the surgery to the storage room. She sighs, realizing the person she was looking for isn't around. Maybe he's already gone since everything's wrapped up. She decides she'll have to try again tomorrow. As she opens the door, she's startled when a doctor suddenly walks out, making her jump. She wonders why a doctor is coming out from there and why he's staring at her like that. His look so intense it reminds her of someone. She tries to shake off the feeling, but it stays with her. She calls out to him, hoping he might remember her. She quickly introduces herself, trying to get him to see who she is, one of the survivors from the orphanage. But he keeps moving, brushing her off like he has no clue what she's talking about. She watches him walk past, feeling confused. She can't believe it. Even his voice matches the one in her memory. She tries again, more desperate now begging him to stop and just hear her out for a few minutes. 
She even offers to buy him a drink, thinking maybe that'll make him listen, but he's still cold and refuses. In her mind, there's no way she could be mistaken. It took everything she had to get here, to track him down. She knows it's him, there's no doubt. She calls out once more, apologizing, and in a rush of emotion, she pulls off his mask. It's him, the man she's been looking for, Logan Lee, now an assistant professor. He looks surprised and asks what she's doing, but she stumbles over her apology, trying to explain herself. As she looks at him, she can't help but notice how different he seems, how much he's changed. She feels a wave of relief mixed with something else as she thanks him for what he did that day. She starts to tell him about how nobody would give her any answers, how the police closed the case, but the memory of that day keeps haunting her. She's certain of what she saw and she needs to understand, but instead of the gratitude she expects, he responds with something that shakes her. He tells her she's forgotten the real story. She wasn't saved by him that day. It was her who did the saving, and it was her who stopped the criminal. The words hang in the air, and she stands there, unable to respond, the weight of what he said sinking in. She thought for sure he was her savior. His words echo in her head, and she can't shake the feeling that something doesn't add up. She tells herself it's impossible. She remembers that day so clearly. She was too scared to even move, too frozen in fear to do anything. How could she have been the one to save anyone? It doesn't make sense. She's lost in her thoughts when suddenly her phone rings. It's her director calling. She glances at the screen, her mind still racing with questions, but she answers. Meanwhile, Dr. O talks to the other doctor, saying the patient's vitals have stabilized and that he's going to clock out for the day. He adds that if the patient's condition worsens, the other doctor should call him. The other doctor nods, thanks him for his hard work, and watches as Dr. O oh turns to leave. Just then, Dr. O oh spots Oh Young standing nearby with her luggage. He raises an eyebrow and calls her name. She turns, surprised to see him, and greets him politely. He looks at her bags and asks where she's headed with all that luggage. Is she planning a trip or maybe running away from home? She smiles awkwardly and tells him she's moving out, explaining that she got kicked out of the dorms. He looks surprised and asks what happened. She sighs and tells him the dorms are closing down because they've been running in the red. The news came at the last minute, so she had to rush to pack up all her things. He nods, understanding, and asks her where she's planning to stay now. She tells him that she'll crash in the on-call room at the hospital for a few days until she figures something out. He frowns, concerned, and tells her that sleeping at the hospital will be uncomfortable. He asks why she doesn't just rent a room nearby. She sighs again and explains that the rent in the neighborhood around the hospital is way too expensive. She says she might have to take on some night shifts to make enough money for a place. He shakes his head, telling her that working at the hospital is already tough enough and now she's thinking about taking on extra shifts. She shrugs and says she doesn't have much choice. She needs to make rent. And besides, back at the dorms, she was practically a part-time employee anyway, doing cleaning, laundry, and even working the register from time to time. He listens, thinking to himself that she's a woman of many talents, not to mention brave for handling so much on her own. After a moment, he asks if she has a little time after work to go somewhere with him. She looks at him curiously and asks where he's thinking of going. He smiles and says that he just thought of a place, a house that he thinks would be perfect for her. She's surprised and asks what kind of place it is. He just tells her to wait and see, keeping the details to himself for now. She nods, curious but trusting him to show her this mysterious place he has in mind. The female lead asks Mansu Kim, the CEO of Manmul Real Estate, about being a live-in assistant. He tells her the house is in a great location, close to the hospital, and in a quiet neighborhood. There's a station and schools just a street away, so it's got everything she might need. He adds that she'll have the entire guest house to herself, which includes a living room, bathroom, dressing room, and even a garden. Everything is fully furnished with electronics. Dr. O oh tells her she won't have to pay rent and will even receive a nice monthly wage. She thanks him, feeling relieved. Dr. O oh then tells her not to worry, but the truth is the owner of the house is quite particular. 
It might not be easy to get used to at first. She nods and says she understands. It's never easy to earn a living, but with these conditions, she's more than willing to assist however she can. He smiles and says, if that's the case, they should go have a look at the house. When she sees the house, her eyes widen and she asks if it's a house or a palace. Kim thanks Dr. Oh for bringing her. He turns to her and asks if her name is Oh Young and whether she thinks she can really handle the job. He explains that aside from the owner's particular personality, the house is really big and difficult to maintain. Everyone who used to work there quit because it was too hard. Oh Young looks around carefully and admits that it will be a challenge. From what she can see, the owner seems to like things extremely clean. The kitchen is full of high-grade tools and equipment, which suggests he has very specific tastes. She also notices that all the books in the living room are neatly labeled, almost as if he's a professional organizer. People like him probably expect everything to be in its exact place, with no dust at all. It'll be tough, but seeing that the living room sofa looks almost new, she figures he's not home very often. She tells them she can handle it. Kim tells Dr. Oh that Oh Young is really smart and he can already see she'll handle everything on her own without much supervision. Dr. Oh agrees, saying it's rare to find someone as thorough and hardworking as Oh Young. But Dr. Lee steps in and says no. They're both surprised and ask him why not. He says it's because he's uncomfortable and thinks she might be uncomfortable around him too. Oh Young quickly responds, saying it's fine with her. He asks if that's true, and she nods, explaining that she has nowhere else to go and really wants to work here. Kim reminds Dr. Lee that he was just saying a few days ago how much he needed someone to help around the house, but Dr. Lee still refuses. Oh Young then asks Dr. Lee if it's because of what happened that night. Both Kim and Dr. Oh are caught off guard. She explains that she wonders if he's avoiding her because he thinks she'll hold him responsible for something. She admits she can't fully remember what happened that day, but she knows he carried her to safety. She adds that if he truly dislikes her, there's nothing she can do, and she wanted to keep the memory of that night to herself. Dr. Lee listens carefully and doesn't respond immediately. Dr. Lee remains quiet for a bit longer, then finally agrees and says they can sign the contract. Oh Young is relieved and thanks him for giving her the chance. She feels a bit of weight lift off her shoulders, knowing that, at least for now, she has a place to stay and a job to do. Dr. Lee tells her that the house has a lot of rules, and she'll have to follow them carefully. She nods and says she understands. He says that he expects everything to be kept in perfect condition, and that she should treat the house as if it's her own responsibility. She agrees again and assures him that she'll take good care of it. She's not entirely sure what to expect, but she knows that she won't let fear or uncertainty stop her from doing what she needs to do. Oh Young starts to wonder if that means she has succeeded in convincing him. Dr. Lee tells her that he doesn't need to argue with her since he doubts she will last even a week in the job. He explains that the night of the incident left a big impression on him too. And maybe they should try to spend some time together to remember what happened that night slowly. Oh Young chuckles a little nervously and thinks to herself that maybe she just made a huge mistake. She feels a mix of excitement and anxiety at the idea of spending more time with him. She can't shake the feeling that this could either be a good thing or a disaster. Kim decides to leave everything to Dr. Oh and says goodbye to him. Dr. Lee asks if they can sign the contract now. Oh Young starts to get a bad feeling about this whole situation but she takes a deep breath and reads out all the rules from the contract. First, she must make sure that all the houseware is always in its place. Next, she has to wipe down all the furniture in the house with a dry rag and polish it with special wax and oil once a week. She needs to air out the bedding every morning, letting it dry in the sun, and dust it with a vacuum. The bedding must be washed separately three times a week. Oh Young must memorize the names of each flower and tree in the garden and take care of them with the right nutrients, soil, and replant them every morning, evening, or as needed. She reads that if even one plant gets sick or dies, she has to leave the house with no excuses, which makes her feel nervous. 
Then she sees that one of the most important rules is about preparing dinner. She learns that she must make quality steak from Korean beef for five people, cooked rare. She asks if she has to do that for every dinner. Dr. Lee asks if she thinks it's too difficult. He says he won't mind if she doesn't feel confident and wants to give up at this point. Oh Young tells him that she will do her best, and she considers it her way of repaying him for saving her. Dr. Lee smiles and says that is good. He warns her that breaking any rules in the contract will mean she has to leave without warning. Dr. O oh agrees and then asks if they can take a look at the guest house where she will be staying. Dr. O oh shows her the room, and Oh Young looks around in amazement. She says she has only seen rooms like this on television. Dr. O oh asks her if she likes it, and she happily replies that she does. She notices how large and comfortable it is, but she also remembers that the house owner's personality is pretty terrible, just like Dr. Lee mentioned. Dr. Lee shrugs and says that's just how he is. He adds that if she gets to know him better, she might realize that he has a very sad backstory. Oh Young thinks about this and wonders what kind of story he has that could make him that way. She wonders to herself how they both know each other and if they are friends. Dr. Lee says that he met Dr. Oh while studying in America. He mentions that he has probably been back for about three years now. Then, when she thinks about that night she talked about with Dr. Lee, she quickly adds that she only said that because she wanted to work in the house. She realizes that she completely forgot about that detail. Dr. Lee tells her that, whatever happened that night, he supports her decision to stay. She asks him what he means, and he begs her to stay in the house because he needs someone bright like her around. She thinks for a moment and decides that if that's the case, she will stick it out until she finds another place to rent. Dr. Lee agrees and says that's okay. He gets ready to leave and tells her goodbye. She tells him to drive safe as he goes. After he leaves, she thinks to herself that he is a really good person. Now she needs to get ready to do some work, so she walks into the kitchen. Dr. Lee tells her that he already had dinner, so she can just make something simple for herself. She starts searching for ingredients, but quickly realizes that the refrigerator looks like it is just for decoration because the only thing inside is water. She looks around the kitchen and sees nothing to eat except for a packet of ramen. She sighs, thinking that she will have to go grocery shopping tomorrow morning. How can a kitchen only have utensils and spices? Just then, she hears Dr. Lee walking back in. She thinks to herself that she hates to admit it, but he really does look heavenly. She asks him if he wants some ramen, but he replies that she must not have read the whole contract. He tells her that unnecessary meals are forbidden in the house. She tells Dr. Lee that making food isn't unnecessary, it's necessary for her survival. He responds by saying that whatever it is, she should make sure it doesn't smell. She thinks to herself that he is trying to make her work hard without even feeding her properly. So, she goes ahead and makes the food. Once it's ready, she starts to leave the house with it. Dr. Lee stops her and asks where she is going with the food. She tells him that he told her to make sure it doesn't smell, so she is going outside. He says that's fine, so she walks out. As she looks around, she sees a nice spot in the garden to sit and eat. She thinks to herself that the garden is really well taken care of. They said he has been living without an assistant for quite a while, so she wonders who has been taking care of the garden. Could it be the guy who looks like he could kill someone with just a glare? She walks into the garden and sees Dr. Lee staring at her. She quickly says that she is busy and has to do the dishes. Then she walks back to the kitchen. When she gets to the kitchen, she asks him what is wrong with the dish soap. He starts to say something about the living room, but she interrupts him and asks why the dish soap in the house doesn't make any bubbles. He explains that it is made of oxygenated anionic materials, which means it doesn't have color, taste, or toxic properties. She cuts him off again and asks how he can get rid of oil on the dishes with that soap since the ones with bubbles from the local store work much better. She points out that the fancy scrubber he has doesn't work well at all. He tells her that he'll see her tomorrow morning since it will be their last day together, and then he leaves. After he goes, 
she wonders if she was being too cheeky with him. Later, she jumps onto her bed and says it's so soft. She can't believe she will be sleeping there. Is it a dream? She feels happy because she'll finally be able to sleep peacefully for the first time in a while. After some time, she wakes up from tossing and turning and comes out of her room. She tells herself that no matter how comfortable the bed is, it is still someone else's house. So she should get some sleep if she is going to wake up early tomorrow. Suddenly, she hears a loud noise and wonders to herself if that was a scream. Oh Young thinks to herself if that was Lee's voice. She wonders if something happened to him. She looks outside and says she doesn't think it's a thief. Then she picks up her bottle of water and wonders if maybe he had a nightmare. Should she at least get him a cup of water? But then she remembers how he treated her. He is a mean man who wouldn't even let her eat a pack of ramen. So why should she help him? Or could it be because of that event? She walks inside and sees him struggling. He looks upset, and for a moment she feels a twinge of sympathy, but then she shakes it off. He has been nothing but rude to her since she got here. The next morning, Oh Young greets Lee with a cheerful, Good morning, and says he is up early. She wonders if he didn't sleep well. She asks him if he wants to eat first or take a shower. He looks around the house and notices everything is spotless. He mentions they should make a meal at seven, which makes her think that maybe he's finally starting to appreciate her work. He thinks to himself that she must have finished cleaning already. Oh Young then asks him if he wants her to make coffee. She adds that she is really good at it because she worked at a cafe for five years. She is eager to impress him, especially since he seems a little grumpy today. As she looks at him, she thinks he looks really tired, unlike yesterday. He starts to say something about the coffee beans, but she jumps in and finishes for him, saying there are full bodies with a faint scent of fruit, that they have a great bitterness, and that they are single-origin AA coffee beans from Kenya. She promises to make the best cup using 27 grams, feeling proud of her coffee knowledge. Lee replies that making coffee wasn't in the contract. Oh Young, feeling a bit defensive, responds that it is her way of repaying him for letting her sleep in a fancy house. She explains that she has never slept in a place like this before. It has always been a single room or a half basement, and she thinks he should understand how special this is for her. Lee thinks to himself that she is pretty blunt about it, but he finds her honesty refreshing. She reminds him that he shouldn't drink coffee on an empty stomach and insists that she will prepare breakfast, too. He says that's okay, and he'll just have the coffee first. Oh Young quickly replies, asking what he is saying because hot coffee is the number one cause of upset stomachs and ulcers. She rushes him to go wash up and tells him to leave everything to her. She's feeling confident now and is determined to make a good breakfast. After a little while, Oh Young serves breakfast. She tells Lee she made a bit of everything since he said she could make whatever except salads. He tastes the food, and she eagerly asks him how it is, feeling nervous but excited. He says it's not bad and wonders if she has a cooking certification or something. His compliment boosts her confidence. Just then, he sees her sitting down and tells her not to let her guard down. He asks her what she is doing, and she replies that she is having breakfast. She feels a bit awkward sitting there, but she enjoys the food she made. He tells her she can eat later by herself. Oh Young feels a little hurt by that. She asks if she has to eat alone. He explains that he has to go to work and if he eats later, the food will get cold and he won't have time to clean up. He mentions that meals are meant to be shared so she can have conversations with other people. Oh Young tells him to stop, saying it's enough and she feels a mix of frustration and disappointment. She apologizes and decides to go eat somewhere else, feeling a bit deflated. She playfully asks if being good to him will go up his nose if they eat together, trying to lighten the mood, but she knows it's a bit of a stretch. Lee's phone suddenly rings, and he quickly gets up. Oh Young asks him where he is going in a surprised tone. He tells her it's an emergency, she points out that he hasn't had his breakfast yet, and then it hits her that before he was her employer, he is the number one surgeon at Taysen University Hospital. She feels a bit worried for him, so she tells him to wait. He asks what she wants. In a moment of spontaneity, 
she grabs a spoonful of steak and puts it in his mouth, saying it's so he doesn't get tired during surgery. She thinks to herself that she just wants to help him, and he should make sure to eat later. But instead of being grateful, he just stares at her in surprise. Oh Young begins to question if that was a mistake. She realizes it might have been a bit too forward. She explains that she thought he was in a rush, so she acted quickly and put the food in his mouth. As soon as she says this, he starts chasing her around the kitchen. Um, she runs a little, feeling a mix of embarrassment and nervousness, and she keeps saying that she didn't mean anything bad by it. Well, she begs him to let her live, laughing a little as she tries to escape, but she can't help but feel a bit guilty for her impulsive action. She just wanted to make sure he was okay, but now it seems like she has made things a little awkward. The doctor stands in the operating room, looking at the patient on the table. The man is 54 years old and arrived in shock from blood loss because of a traffic accident. Dr. Lee looks at the chest scans, and they confirm that there are damaged ribs and several ruptured organs. The surgery starts at 8.15 a.m. Another doctor tells Dr. Lee that the patient's condition is too severe and that there's no hope. Dr. Lee cuts him off sharply, telling him to shut up. They are going to repair the hernia, find the source of the bleeding, and stitch it all up. He reminds everyone to keep a close watch on the patient's vitals. If he goes into cardiac arrest, it will be a disaster for all of them. He asks if they understand, and they all nod, saying yes. After the surgery, one of the doctors comments that no matter how he looks at it, Dr. Lee isn't human. The second doctor agrees, saying he thinks Dr. Lee is either a cyborg or an alien. Dr. Lee replies that he just saved a patient who had multiple ruptured organs and a hernia. He explains that he didn't earn his single-digit mortality rate for nothing. He is incredibly fast, so much so that he wishes he had extra hands when he's assisting. The third doctor, sitting nearby, asks if they don't think he gets excited when there is a lot of bleeding. The other two doctors shake their heads and say, no way, that's just too far. The third doctor points out that it's strange how Dr. Lee always shows up right after surgeries. Just then, they see Dr. Lee coming out of the operating room, and they greet him. He thanks them for their hard work, but when one doctor compliments him on his performance that day, he just walks away. The doctor comments that Dr. Lee is so cold-blooded and that he would be perfect if he were just a little more human. Dr. Lee walks into his office and notices a lunchbox sitting on his desk with a letter from Oh Young. The letter says that there was a lot of breakfast left, so he should please eat some after his surgery. She also mentions that she works in the surgical unit now, so if he needs anything, he should let her know and she will see him at home. He chuckles to himself and thinks that she is really a strange woman. Oh Young, meanwhile, wonders if the emergency went well. It's way past lunchtime, after all. She catches herself thinking about him when Dr. O oh calls her. He asks how it went this morning. Oh Young is talking to Dr. O oh on the phone and asks him who he thinks she is. She tells him that everything went well, of course. She thought Dr. Lee would be determined to kick her out, but he is actually more considerate than she expected. Still, she wonders who keeps absolutely no groceries in their house. She finds him so blunt and irritable, and he always has this glare whenever she tries to talk to him. Dr. O thinks to himself that it's just expected for her to follow orders. She continues and says she thinks Dr. Lee had a nightmare last night and asks if he said anything to him. Dr. O replies that he didn't say anything in particular. He thinks to himself that, as expected, Dr. Lee hasn't been able to get over it yet. Oh Young then asks what time it is. She realizes she needs to finish waxing the floors before her shift ends today. She quickly says she'll see him later and runs off. Dr. Oh thinks to himself that at least she seems to be adjusting well. Now Oh Young is in the room waxing the floor. She is thinking about how she will finish soon and then go home to marinate the steak she bought. She plans to pick up some balsamic vinegar and a few other ingredients on the way home. Suddenly, a child runs by, and she sees him pour juice all over the floor. She thinks to herself that she just wiped it down, and now it's messy again. She rushes over to hold his hand and tells him that he shouldn't be running around like that. 
It's dangerous, especially since she is waxing the floors, and it's really slippery. She asks him to please be careful. The boy stubbornly tells her no, saying that his mom told him not to listen to strangers. Oh Young thinks to herself that he is definitely going to fall, and just as she worries, he does fall. She says, I told you that you would fall. The juice bottle in his hand breaks, and she quickly runs over to him. She asks if he's all right and tells him to show her where it hurts. He starts crying and calls for his mother. His mother rushes over and asks what happened. The little boy, Chorong, tells his mother that the female lead scared him. His mother immediately turns to her and asks what is wrong with her and what she did to her son. The female lead quickly replies that she didn't do anything. She just told him that it's slippery and that he shouldn't be running around. The mother is not satisfied with her answer and asks if she couldn't have told him gently instead. She wants to know why the female lead scared him, calling her a gangster. Then she demands to see the manager. The female lead thinks to herself that the mother is not listening to her. Just then, Juim walks in and asks what happened. The female lead starts to panic because she realizes that this situation is getting out of control. She worries that it is becoming a bigger deal than it should be. She knows she needs to fix things quickly before they get worse. Korong's mother tells Juim that she needs to train her employees better. She asks what is wrong with a little kid running around for a bit and if she understands. Juim says she understands and apologizes. Then she turns to the female lead and asks why she is just standing there. She tells her to go pick up the pieces of glass. Oh Young bends down to clean up and thinks to herself that she needs to hurry and get the place cleaned up. But then she starts remembering that night, and it makes her feel nauseous. One of the other people starts mumbling that she bets the female lead is just pretending to be sick to get out of this situation, but she can't fool her. Another person asks her what is wrong, and someone else asks what all the commotion is about in the hospital. One person says that they think the boy's mother is wrong. Just then, Dr. Lee walks in and says that it's enough. He explains that a few minutes ago he saw a kid running around, and he was curious about who was letting their kid run around in the hospital hall. Then he saw Oh Young telling the kid that she is waxing the floor and that he shouldn't run because it's very slippery. He wonders where the temper she usually has when she is scolding him has gone. But then the kid runs off and falls. Chorong's mother asks if he is saying that her son fell. He says he can show her the CCTV footage if she wants. He tells her what he saw. Her wild child was running around and fell by himself. He even spilled some of his juice on the female lead's clothes and face. The mother then asks him who he thinks he is, talking about what he witnessed. Just then, another doctor walks in and calls for her and Chorong. She runs to meet the doctor and tells him that the people in the hospital are ignoring them while their child is hurt. She points at Dr. Lee and says, especially that man. He quickly tells her not to point at him. She runs up to him and greets him. Dr. Lee asks if they are with him, that loud mother and son, and he quickly apologizes. He says he should make sure to resolve this quickly. He won't let it slide otherwise. He tells her he understands. He walks up to Oh Young and tells her to get up. She thanks him, and he tells her to forget it and make sure she is walking straight. She says her legs are cramped up. Meanwhile, Juim watches from a distance and wonders what is going on. She thinks he is someone who doesn't care about anything except surgery, so why is he being so nice to her? Oh Young sits down and thinks about how clean his research lab is, just like his house. Then she sees the Hippocratic Oath on the wall, and Dr. Lee asks if it is her first time seeing it. She says yes. She has been cleaning the hospital for a while now, but she has never seen one in another doctor's room. She asks if that means he is special. He says she could say that. Whatever the case, this profession is something he has chosen and continues to do. But more importantly, he asks her if she still has trouble remembering what happened that night. He mentions that it seemed like she couldn't even look at the pieces of glass earlier. She tells him that the truth is all she can remember are some blurry memories. She remembers that Director G passed away that day and that she passed out from being choked. After that, she doesn't remember anything at all. 
so she asks him to tell her what happened that night. He tells her she could just check the CCTV footage instead of asking him. She explains that the prosecutor in charge of the case told her it would be better not to see it because it might make her trauma last longer. He asks her why she is trying to learn more about the case than since the culprit has already been caught, and they ruled it as a case of self-defense for her. It is a good ending for everyone. She replies that she didn't do anything to the criminal. That day, she remembers everything about the person who was choking her. She remembers the look in his eyes and his chilling voice, so she wonders why she can't remember anything else. Dr. Lee stands up and gives her a blanket, saying he will lend it to her for a bit. He tells her to rest for a while before she goes back. She calls him and tells him that she wasn't eavesdropping on purpose, but she heard him scream last night. She was worried and wondering if he was having a hard time because of what happened that night, just like her. Since they've gone through the same experience, she tells him he can feel free to talk to her anytime. He says no, and she thinks to herself that he rejected her instantly. He then says he regrets it. He should have executed the culprit before she did. She asks herself what he is talking about. He explains that it would have been ruled as self-defense anyway. Just a few more times, and the guy would have passed out slowly while in pain. She thinks to herself that the person she met that night wasn't her savior. He was the killer. She steps out of the office and slams the door behind her. She must be twisted to think she was worried about that deadly man. He better watch out because she is definitely going to survive in his house and she'll make him regret this for a long time. Her legs are trembling as she turns to leave when someone speaks up and says, excuse me. The lady offers her a handkerchief and says she doesn't know if it will get the juice stains off. The female lead thanks her and thinks to herself that she doesn't know this woman. She seems like a nurse, but does she really know her? She tells the lady she will make sure to wash it before she returns it. The nurse replies that she should feel free to keep it, but more importantly, they have something they're curious about. The nurse asks if it's really true that she is Ina Kim, a surgery nurse from Taesan University Hospital, and her co-workers are standing beside her. Our female lead says yes, and she somehow ended up working as an assistant at Dr. Lee's house after work. One of the nurses asks if that's how she knows him and says if only she could visit his house at least once. The female lead thinks to herself that she definitely can't tell them that she's living with him. Nurse Ina asks what Dr. Lee is like at home. The female lead asks what she means. Ina explains that she wants to know what he looks like at home. She is sure he is perfect even when he's not working, and she's certain even his relaxed looks are beautiful. The thought of seeing that side of him every day makes them all so jealous, and the female lead can't help but think that everyone really seems to admire him. She knows he's handsome, but she feels a little uncomfortable with all the attention. She says she should head back to work now. The nurse asks how old she is, and the female lead says she is 27. The nurse replies that she's 28 and asks if she can call her Unni from now on. The female lead agrees, but before she can say more, Juum cuts in and asks if she can have a minute with her. The female lead says yes, thinking that things are getting a little too much for her. She carries two heavy bags inside, feeling like she aged 10 years in one day. She knows she needs to hurry and marinate the beef before Dr. Lee comes back home. Just then, she hears a car pull up. She tells herself to snap out of it and starts cooking quickly. While she's working, the potatoes start to slip out of her hands, and one rolls dangerously close to Dr. Lee's feet. When she sees him, she welcomes him home and tells him that the food is almost ready. She sets the table and asks how it is, hoping that the meal is enough for his picky tastes. She glances at him and sees him smiling, and she wonders if that means he likes it. But then he tells her to pack her bags. Confused, she asks what he means and why she should pack. He says that while the marinade is good, like the sauce is a mess and doesn't go with the meat at all. She insists that can't be true, and he tells her to sort it out herself. She clings to his legs, pleading with him to listen. She reminds him that she had a tough day cleaning windows, her hands are shaking, and Miss Dweem is always breathing down her neck, 
plus the nurses were giving her a hard time about him. Dr. Lee looks at her, puzzled by what she is saying. She asks him to please understand just this once. He tells her to let him go, and she wonders how he can cook something perfectly if it's her first time making it. She points out that it says so in the contract, showing him where it mentions that the employer will provide the steak recipe and test it afterward. He asks her to give him the contract, and she tells him not to crinkle it. He mentions that Dr. O won't get away with this. She insists that she told him it was true. He asks if she has any marinated beef left, and she replies that there's a bit remaining. He tells her to follow him, and she wonders if he is really going to show her his recipe. He says this won't happen a second time, so she should pay close attention. He lists the ingredients, asparagus, zucchinis, and onions for roasted vegetable garnishes, and mashed potatoes on the side. For the sauce, he explains that it has balsamic as a base, along with red wine, balsamic vinegar, honey, oyster sauce, a third of an onion, cloves of garlic, pepper, and sliced oyster mushrooms. She realizes she is missing one ingredient from the recipe and writes everything down. He then asks her to please bring some plates, and she says yes. She thinks about what she'll have for dinner and realizes there isn't any meat left now. He offers her some to eat, and she asks if she can really have it. He says, of course. This is how she'll truly learn the recipe. She smiles, feeling a bit better. She thought her day was a mess, so she thanks him for the food and asks if he can show her the recipe one more time. He simply replies that there won't be a second chance, but she thinks that how the day ends isn't so bad after all. Enjoying this story so far? Comment part two below. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, ciao.